Welcome to Turning the Table, the most progressive weekly podcast for today's food and beverage industry, featuring staff-centric operating solutions for restaurants in the hashtag new hospitality culture. Join Jim Taylor of Benchmark 60 and Adam Lamb as they turn the tables on the prevailing operating assumptions of running a restaurant in favor of innovative solutions to our industry's most persistent challenges. Thanks for joining us. And now, on to the show. Welcome back to Turning the Table. This is episode 110, Building Highly Effective Hospitality Teams, sponsored by Benchmark 60. We ask that you share the show with someone you care about who can find this information useful. And we are not only the most progressive restaurant podcast, but one of the fastest growing ones, now breaking the top 100 business podcasts charts in both the UK and Australia. We'll have our guests on Doug Newkirk, Chop House, and Corporate Ryan Dodge of Lifetime Fitness. But before we bring them on, I want to introduce my co-host, Jim Taylor, Benchmark 60. Yeah. How are you doing? Very, I'm very good. And a quick shout out to some of our faithful listeners, such as Patrick McClary, Allison O'Leary Creason, Shane Lobsinger, Bing Oliver, Jessica Lara, Dustin O'Her, Chris that's our, our, our Brady Sloan. <laughs> and we've got Doug Newkirk joining our stream. And today's question is how to build a highly effective hospitality team. We're probably going to go in a lot of different places. Jim, what do you think is kind of up for you as a question about this topic? Well, I mean, it's, it, I, it, there's so many different places we could start. One of the things that I'm, I'm actually looking forward to having some discussion about today is I had a conversation with a guy yesterday who was talking about his belief is that you can lead from one of two places. You can lead from love or you can lead from fear. Mm -hmm. And he was like, there's nowhere in the middle. It's love or fear. And that hit me really hard and has stuck with me. And so I think we'll end up in some interesting discussion about one of those or both of those types of, you know, opposite ends of the spectrum today. So looking forward to the discussion. Yeah. And the other thing, it just seems like, I, I don't know if it's just weird timing, but over the last several days, I've gotten quite a few comments and direct messages uh, around this, this viewpoint that some hospitality professionals have that basically want to shit on everybody that's coming up in the industry and everybody's kind of jumping on that bandwagon that they don't have the right work ethic and yada, yada, yada. And I've never believed that that's true because we've been dealing this, you know, Probably, I, I, as far as I know, since the 80s, and I know Chef Ryan had a, an interesting comment that, you know, this has been going on for centuries and has its roots in the masculine feminine. So without any further ado, I want to add both Chef Ryan Dodge and Doug Newkirk. Yeah. <laughs> for the record, gents, I haven't seen that man's face about 52 pounds ago is the last time I saw I, I know he's your, yeah, we can hear you perfect, man. Uh, I know he's... Uh, He's a large presence in your life. So I really appreciate the fact that uh, you yuked him up. So Doug, I want to start with you because I had a conversation with Chef yesterday and he mentioned this uneven equation, like how to balance the equation with hospitality teams. And the first thing that popped up into my head was, you know, what's the difference between motivation and inspiration? Because you've got teams that you lead. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, there's a couple of different components. Motivation, it's obviously personal to that that individual, right? You got to dig a little deep to find out what gets them out of bed. You got to dig a little deep to find out what are the things that kind of excites them. And, and, and ironically, when I do my hiring process, I actually go right into that. And I, and I really try to understand these people from the minute I meet them. And I don't want to understand them inside of a restaurant. I want to understand them in their real life. So the things that motivate them aren't the service aspect of inside of a dining room. It's not the cocktails that they're pouring. It's it's the things that they do outside of that establishment so they're able to bring 100% of themselves into the room. So I start the minute I meet people. My interview process starts with making it a conversation about them. And I want to know everything I can about them with within a certain parameter so that I could inevitably use that to help them grow. Nine times out of 10, people don't even know that they have that ability. They just... They just start talking. And then there's the folks that tell you that they do meditation. You ask them about it. And then they kind of say, well, I'm going to start. And then there's the folks that tell you, I like, I like to read. And I read 13 books in the last month. And then you start talking about a book that they love. And then you're always able to reference that sort of log later. Excellent. Chef, the question as you popped off was, insofar as your professional experience, what's the difference between motivation and inspiration? 
<clears throat> wow, what a profound question. <laughs> I've wrestled with this notion quite a bit recently in my own career. However, I would state that there's two words that I hear that I, they're like trigger words for me. Mm -hmm. And one is excited and the other one is frustrated. They're like trigger words because I find that there's a great deal of presentation of what the potential opportunity looks like that people get quote unquote excited about. Then there's the follow-up to excitement, which feels like a juxtaposition, which is frustration. And the reason that the frustration is there is because the pitch that they were given, that they were excited about, isn't what it actually is. And I think that it does people a disservice to overbill the profound lessons that will be learned within hospitality or within this industry as easy or something that's going to come like a light strike of lightning to them in any circumstance or elevate them immediately without putting in the work. And I don't think that we honestly do a good representation of allowing the process of work and allowing the process of learning to be a part of what we're sincerely selling in this industry. And so I would say the difference between motivation, motivation, you can motivate someone with money. You can motivate somebody financially. You can motivate them with a future place in their career. If you do this, you'll earn that. Inspiration is living and demonstrating the example, showing what's possible, inspiring that if I actually participate, listen, and learn, I can achieve what this person is able to achieve through sheer grit, will, and mm -hmm. determination. And so I think that motivation can be manipulation. Inspiration is genuine and authentic. <laughs> that's, that's pretty juicy. And, and, and Jim, you know, you've spent 20 years, you know, building highly effective teams for one of the most progressive restaurant companies in Canada. What's your take on it? Well, how do I follow up with? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's got to dig, you got to dig deep, Jim. That's, that's bang on, right? I mean, I think we talked about this on one of the other, one of our other discussions, Adam, about the idea that, and I was challenged with this by a mentor of mine years ago that basically said, if the people you work with don't love coming to work with you specifically, you're not going to be successful. And so I think there's a combination of being able to, you know, motivate people in a, in a, genuine way and being able to inspire people to want to try to do more that kind of comes along with that. But that, that thought process of when they see my name on the schedule running the shift or when they know that I'm the general manager of the restaurant or whatever that might be, if they're not excited about that part about working alongside, then there's going to be a problem. Um, that became a filter for me through my whole career and, and, you know, still does around if people don't love working with you, then you're going to have a problem. Because it changes, for me, it changed the way that I asked questions, gave feedback, promoted people, hired people, terminated, I mean, everything, right? It was, and actually the challenge at the beginning was it close to me in a way where I actually had to terminate somebody one day when I was a fairly new manager. And this mentor of mine said, you know, I bet you can't, well, maybe not I bet, but I challenge you to go into that conversation with that person with the intention that when you're, con when you're finished with that meeting, where you're terminating this person's employment, that they stand up, they shake your hand and they say, thank you. And for me, I was going, how's that even possible? But I think that anyway, that became a filter for me for my whole career around motivating, trying to motivate and inspire people to have a positive work environment and enjoy working with the people they work with. So did that person get up and shake your hand at the end of that meeting? Actually, we're, we're still friends. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I've, I've always felt that, you know, a, 
that termination can be an absolute positive action for both not only the person that's being terminated, but also the crew. And walking into that particular situation as a positive thing, as opposed to a negative thing, can often shift the energy as well. Yeah. And Chef, I wanted to come back to you because yesterday you said something about this unequal equation that really kind of rocked me a little bit and had me thinking about it all day. And I want to be conscious of, you know, our time, but I think it really would serve this conversation for you to kind of go into that a little bit if you're willing. Absolutely, Adam. If you could jar my memory a little bit, we were talking about a lot and we were kind of talking <laughs> about it, I think, before, but maybe set the table for me because I can go. I right. Can go it was it was about, you know, kind of leads back to what you were saying about us have doing a poor job at communicating effectively what a life in this industry could look like and that we haven't done a very good job at being able to communicate effectively that, you know, there's a certain amount of maturity that comes when you're 20 years in that you're not going to have in the first five or 10 years and how that maturity shifts your outlook, not only as you as a professional, but the way you're connecting with everybody else. And you were talking about, you know, climbing this mountain of, because you motivate currently, how many people are under that you are responsible for in your business? During the summer, it was, as t it was like up to 3,500 employees across the country and in Canada, but it was, it was significant. We have, a, we have an additional that we offer outside of in our pools, but I think I'm, I think I'm grasping and I can kind of put myself back into that conversation. I mm -hmm. think that we have created somewhat of a lopsided scenario within our industry. And that is, we, we have such a, a vast off of different offerings. I mean, you look at everything from grocery to fast casual to fine dining, these one-off locations, these corporate locations, these, these places that do the same sandwich day in, day out, the same salad day in, day out. And essentially, when we go to hire, a lot of the time, what we've created is we've created a margin, a profitability margin that is so narrow and we can only afford labor at a really opening rate. I mean, it is, it is a disservice because we can't afford a lot of the experience or quality experience that comes in time with the industry. And as you acquire more experience, you grow. So we, we bring in a very base level, entry level experience, which ultimately leads to what's popular, which is the fast casual simplicity is to make it simple, stupid. Doug Newhook term monkey with a football, like that easy. And it's really dumbed down really the, the other proposition of the dining etiquette for people to endure those experiences and say, I want to stay in this industry. I want to stay doing this. We've done the industry a disservice because there's no attraction. There's no future. There's no feeling of tangible, like I've acquired a new skill that I want to grow off of, mm. where you can take it to another environment where people like myself and you guys have, have grown our, our livelihoods our industry, in this industry where we've had experiences in the, the highest level, Michelin, you name it, across the country, across the, the, the world, and experience those kind of experiences. That, that isn't being realized in this kind of modern, quick service fast casual environment that is is showing people what other we talked about this to a length yesterday and i think maybe this is where you were taking me was like mentorship somebody that mm -hmm. you learn under somebody that you learn the skill the etiquette the verbiage the technique i mean when i watched jacques papan and and julia child i imagine no one in in this generation is interested in listening to these two people like fumble through this old classic technique and, and building a bouquet garni and spiking pearl onions with cloves. I mean, I, I don't, right. it's, it's gone. It's lost, completely lost in translation. Shit comes in a bag and you heat it in a microwave. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, I'm not getting juiced up by that. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, at the bare minimum. Doug, I think, do you mind if I touch on? No, please. I was gonna. I was gonna kick it to you because I think he's singing your song. 
Well, yeah, he is. And and I think, well, you know, Dodge and I had the pleasure of working with each other for quite some time. And the first time we met, you know, we're talking about an executive chef who obviously we spoke about before, 3,500 team members. The first time we met, he was in the inside of the kitchen and I was on the pass. That was the very first time we met. So here you have somebody who's worked his tail off from the ground up, still throwing on the apron, still working the line with the team, still getting to know their names and then remembering them when he comes back. You know, I think one of the things that we have done a poor job as an industry is that we don't make the the roles that we hold look good. And it's something that Dodge and I used to say all the time, like, you know, when when you have a leader or a manager or somebody in the zone who just doesn't enjoy it and just allows their mental state to take over, they're not glorifying the role and making it attractive to the people that may have it in the back of their head. Hey, I think I'm going to be good at that. And one of the things that Dodge and I used to really just bring to the table was like, you got to figure out a way to navigate around yourself so that you can make this feel and look appealing to not only, you know, the, the team members, but the, the customers or the members. And then internally, it's going to make you feel good in the long run because, you know, you do it. There's a certain component of acting and fake it till you make it that you have to provide. But there is a level of in order to motivate or inspire somebody. You got to you got to battle through the adversity and you got to make it look good. And then you got a guy like Dodge who at any level of his career slaps on an apron and goes into the back and stands next to the, the, the guy that just started two days ago and remembers his name two months later. And that's a certain thing that a lot of people, when they get to a certain level, they won't even think about the name, the apron, the name tag, the, the uniform. And him and I, I remember we drove up to Boston four hour car drive from New York. And we just spent two days working in zone with a bunch of kids from Massachusetts. And it was the greatest two days ever. He was on the line. I was in the front. We were just doing our thing. And, but what that brought was a, a level of inspiration to the people around us. I mean, there's a guy that we worked with that day who's currently a director of operations with, with Ryan. So I think that there's a certain level of ownership that managers and leaders inside of these four walls need to understand. You got to figure out how to make it look good if you want to grow people with you. And then ultimately, it's going to help you battle through those tough times. There's a lot to chew on in, in just what both of you guys have said. And for me, it comes down to, you know, what does it look like to model mature professionalism for people who are actually looking for that? Because I get that, you know, there's always going to be a dishwasher or a pantry person who's very comfortable being a pantry person and does a great job in that space. And how do you make them feel as as valuable as say, you know, the sous chef or the first cook who's the sharpest knife in the, in the drawer, but might be, you know, exhibiting some uninitiated behavior, right? Mm -hmm. And might need to have somebody pull him underneath his wing and say, Hey, it's time to smarten up brother. Cause you know, your skills only going to take you that far. Mm -hmm. Chef. You know, these are great topics. I think Doug, what you referenced in our experience together is amazing. And I know this. I know that when I come into a space that my personality and my ability to connect and my knowledge, it's, it looms large in a way that can create a vacuum. And so what I have learned to do is I've learned to have my own. So I, I, I a hundred percent agree with that. Listen, if somebody's completely satisfied in their life and they're satisfied in their hours that they work and they're consistent in their job and the only time that you need to like really check in on them is just in passing because they've got it on lock and they're not looking for any more which i've had those employees and i and i love them and they're the backbone they're the under they're the underdog like superheroes of our industry that people don't see that don't, don't aren't looking for accolades but you, you find a way to include them in your own journey and in your own life. And I think that for me, continuing to be curious, continuing to be a seeker and an understander of different concepts, different process, different for me recently, and I've shared this with you in, in Adam, you and I connected on this experience where you did 75 hard and had this profound kind of you doing 75 hard. And sharing that experience with somebody like mm. in the process of the daily connect and where you're at with that, 
we we have no idea how impactful that is for that person to think about their own life and outside of work, what's important and the value that they take forward and challenging themselves to do other things. And I think that my personal, what I've been successful with, feeling successful with, with myself is continuing to grow. And as I grow, I can observe around me an environment that's created, that's a nurturing environment for others to grow. And so what I'm hearing you say is, you know, in that process of growth, you're actually sharing that with people that you're elbow to elbow with. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm connected to the point or to the fact that this sounds like a lot of back of the house stuff, but everything we're talking about is a- applicable to the front of the house, the back of the house at, at, at a unit level, at a corporate level. Jim, I see, I see the wheels turning. <laughs> I'm interested in your feedback about what you're hearing. Well, it, it sounds like, and you know, not to put it back on, on Chef Dodge, but I'm, I'm curious, you mentioned this looming large thing and, you know, I know from when I first started at restaurants that there were, I looked at some of the people that I worked with that were in, you know, positions of responsibility or in management or ownership. And I thought like, you know, I was hooked on the industry at that point already. So I looked at these people thinking, A, I want to be like that and B, I'm terrified of this person or this image or whatever it might be, whether it was the chef or the owner or something. Right. So I'm actually curious about how with 3,500 employees, I mean, if I'm a new employee in your environment, I'm terrified, right? Just that. how do you, how do you bring that down? What, what are, do you have actual go-to things that you try to do to, you know, soften that experience for people so they don't tiptoe around you? I love that question. As far as tiptoeing around me, one of the things that I think is our responsibility as the elder statesmen of the industry is to demonstrate health in a way that has long since been forgotten in our industry. Our burnout rate for our, you know, look, look across our, the scope of our industry and look at the amount of people who are just burnt crispy. When you allow a lot of the toxicity of the environment, which is a relentless environment, it is a nonstop environment. You may turn off the gas, but you, it's, it's something that's coming for you every time. And it goes to the front, it goes to the back, there's theft, there's, there's relationships, there's harassment, there's, I mean, you name it. We, we deal with every element of life from human resources to internal problems. And, and we deal with people as they come. They, mm-hmm. they don't necessarily leave their shit at the door. And so one of the most difficult things I think for us as these elder statement is to remain humble. And the story that you were talking about, Adam, I believe you mentioned it or touched on it is like I started in the dish room. I remember at 14 years old in the pizza place coming in, getting trained in by a guy who who was more interested in smoking heaters on the back dock than doing any of the dishes. And I remember thinking, man, that that's gross. And I don't want to do dishes. And I remember seeing all the waitresses and waiters and people coming back that were like looking at me like, aren't you going to do the dishes? And I was like, not only am I going to do the dishes, but I'm going to fuck throw down on the space. Like, I'm going to make it so that you want to come back here. I'm going to make it so that this is the coolest little area to hang out. Not, not that back dock. We're all, <laughs> so there's an unhealthy aspect to the industry that's almost encouraged, whether that's the alcoholism, the drugs, the, you know, some of my best experiences were my, my, my experiences with those things. Don't get me wrong. I want to acknowledge that that's a rite of passage, I believe, in some cert, in a certain <laughs> Thank you. realm. I mean, it's a rite of passage. I don't want to be over, over like saying that I'm judgmental toward that at all because I'm not. I'm actually, I encourage everyone to experience what the industry is so that they know that there's a future beyond it because the burnout ratio, again, like I said, is high. And it is in every aspect from dive bars to American standard cuisine to the finest five-star Michelin restaurants from standards to execution to just the overall amount of hours of sleep you get from being on your feet for 16 hours. I mean, you're looking for the 
you're looking for the pill. You're looking for the relief. And I get it. Once you graduate from that and you can find like health and balance within boundaries that you create, you trust other people. Because what I've done in that looming large piece that you were just touching on, I want to address is that if I'm there, like the, all uh, eventually people will be like, well, he's here. So he'll take care of it. He has the answer. So it's almost as if I'm keeping them from making the mistake or making the decision or learning how to make a solution oriented decision on the spot. Because if I'm there, then my voice is going to be louder than everybody else's. My solution is going to be the stamp because I, I've been here. I have, I have this. You need it. And it's your turn. And so you graduate to a, from a certain level. And if you don't trust people, then you don't allow, if you don't trust that they're going to fail and figure it out from the failure, which is, in, which is our industry in a nutshell, failure and figuring it out, go give somebody a ribeye and tell them to cook a medium rare for the first time. It doesn't happen. They don't know New York strip versus ribeye versus filet versus terrace versus short ribs. Like they don't know these techniques. They got to teach them. So how they get, and we got to trust them. That's a big risk for us. That's cost. Mm -hmm. So we want to over manage this solution all the time because we don't want to risk it. But then we never move forward and they don't grow. And we continue to kind of have that looming, we're that looming figure. Well, we should be a looming figure in that. What would he do based off of what I've seen, but allow them to grow and learn? Well put. And again, I want to be conscious of our time because this show is meant to not only talk about the issues that are going on, but also to offer some concrete steps that an operator can take back into their operation this weekend. So I want to kind of end our conversation because I know that there's just so much more to be talked about, which is why, you know, I think Jim and I would love to have you guys back for, you know, part two and part three of this conversation. Absolutely. But if each of you were to give one particular tip that's worked for you, maybe somebody's got an operation, they're short staffed, people are starting to get burnt. You can feel the threads starting to spin apart. What's one or two actions that they can actually take going back in and pulling everybody together, if if only for the short term, um, knowing the risks, the problems. I spoke to Scott Turner yesterday in Auden Hospitality, where he's telling me that the the energy crisis in England is so bad that these coffee shops are going from two thousand dollars a month in energy costs to nine thousand if they can find. But and these guys are like I. You know, I'm losing $4,000 a month. I might as well just close my doors. So there's a lot going against us. There always has been. Doug, what's one or two things that you could probably offer that might prove beneficial to bringing everybody together, if not in service to the mission and in service to one another? I, I mean, I, like like Doc said earlier, I, I like to simplify things. So in in, in, in real summary, I make sure that I treat every single person like a human being. I know everyone's name. I want to put them dead in their eye. I want to say, I'm thank, thank you for doing their job. I thank them throughout the experience. If I'm an owner and I have satellite places, I'm going to make sure my management team knows their names. Every single person's names shakes every single person's hand when they get there, says goodbye to every single person when they leave. A lot of people just sneak out the back door and they're gone. And the reality is, I think that we have to start going back to humanity, treat people like humans, just be kind and be friendly. It's not going to pay your rent quicker, but it's sure as sure as shit going to make uh, the environment better for those folks inside. Chef, as you're gazing I, out your window. You're going to get a haiku ready, Ab. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, I, so you, you gave an example of a situation. And if I were to give any advice to somebody going through what you were talking about, the thread or being, you got to, you got to pull the team together in a way. I, I think that the group as a whole, none of, none of any of us do anything in this industry by ourselves. Mm. We have to have an entire staff moving in the same direction. If we have this 
this wide scope of people on every position, they have to be moving toward the same, they all have to move this direction toward the, toward the same target. And if they don't know the, they don't know the obstacle, if they're not aware that we're up against prices that are going to erode our margin that may potentially keep us from having a business at all, then, then it's, it's for whatever reason, they're just kind of going to continue to go through the motions. But if you can, you, you got to be able to share in a way that doesn't create fear or create competitive nature within the group, but you've got to be able to be transparent. And I think the transparency of what we're all up against is one of them being vulnerable to the transparency, not being a victim to it, but bringing everybody in so that they can offer up what their solution is, be heard by the group without judgment, without fear. And if that's something that you're able to do and you have a group of people that are actually able to sit in a room and have a conversation, and this is an investment. Again, like I said, you've got if you're going to make an investment in energy, you better make an investment in your people. If the people that are working together can't communicate in a room talking about what we're up against, then they sure as shit aren't going to be able to do it when the when the fire is on and when the orders are coming in. How are you going to be able to do it then if you can't do it here? So I would bring the people together. I would offer up what we're up against. I would allow them to understand and articulate back what's at stake. And what are we going to do about it? And I would empower them and give them the autonomy to make a decision that moment, whether they're going to go into this thing with me or if they're going to hit the street now. Because we're not going into this thing if, with weak links. We're going into this thing or we're not. You're with me or you're not. And, and I think it's that easy. I think people get to yep. make the choice. We're desperate. If we let people come in that are dragging us down, we're desperate. We've given up. So you're either going to go in this weekend and fight with a group of people that are there to fight with you, that have your six, your 12, your three, your nine, mm -hmm. or you're going in blind. And if you don't have hammerhead 360 peripheral, then you're going to get got. <laughs> head on, head on us, head on a swivel, head on a yeah. swivel. Chef, are you hiring? <laughs> oh, <laughs> move to, the, to the U.S. across the continent. Well, that, you. that brings up a great point because I asked Chef yesterday, are you on social? And he said, no. And he said, that's deliberate. I don't want any distractions. But it begs the question, Chef, if someone wants to get a hold of you, even just to follow up this conversation, how do they do that? Reach out to me. I'll get, I'll, I'll pass it on. Just kidding. <laughs> you <laughs> Oh, I'm, up. I'm a bit of a I'm a bit of a enigma in that sense. I I my energy is I'm very selective with my energy, and I've been irresponsible with it in the past, and I've been it's been taken, not with any without any. I mean, it's lessons of life. And so I think that there's a great social connection that's happening through these different places. But you can get a hold of me. And my name is Ryan Dodge. And you, I, I guess that I, I'm not on anything other than LinkedIn. But yeah, to your point, you can get a hold of Doug. But I, I literally <laughs> intentionally do that because I'm not trying to personify some sort of fraud. And I, and I worked for Gary Danko back in the day. And one of the most profound things, we went to the Masters of Food and Wine. It was the 21st annual Masters of Food and Wine in Caramel, California. And it was the last one they did. And it was a great experience. And it was early in the days of Top Chef. You guys know the show Top Chef? Sure. Mm -hmm. There was a contestant that had gotten booted from Top Chef early in the like first or second season that was there and literally was making a fool of themselves. And I'll never forget coming off of the initial, like we did a cooking demonstration for Gary's lobster, Chef, Chef Danko's lobster dish in front of 500 people. He was signing autographs. And then I went into the kitchen and I literally set the tone for that day of how we were going to do 500 plates of this lobster dish with a bunch of volunteers and interns and different things. But I, I'll never forget that night as we were talking, because I was watching this person make a fool of themselves. And I said, hey, you know, what do you think of that show, Top Chef? And he said, you know, Dodge, I, I try to avoid too much television. I try to avoid too much of this. 
these things that are asked of me because if I don't have control over my editing, then I may be giving off the wrong impression. And so that kind of stuck with me. And so I like to have control over my my editing. So I, I don't have somebody else influencing my or taking out of my message out of the, the intent of the narrative. So well it's also it's also, you know, a great exercise in creating healthy boundaries as well, which something, you know, a lot of folks, including myself in the industry, haven't really haven't really exercised, you know, what a healthy boundary looks like. But that that'll be a topic for another show because I know if I throw that out there, we'll keep going. Yeah. But Jim, I wanted to finish with you and perhaps share one or two tips that can actually keep, you know, can actually bring a team back together. Well, you know, there's so many places we could go here again, right? And and Chef Dodge, I mean, I can't thank you enough for all of this insight because you're you're clearly incredibly passionate and and very good at what you do. I think it's really I could listen to you talk all day. Hopefully we get a chance to do this again. But you know, I think that I've had some interesting conversations in the last few days, you know, with everything from corporate to single unit restaurant operators. And it's really interesting as we head into the fall and into the winter in some, you know, parts of the world that this employee retention thing just doesn't go away. And it's actually, I think in some markets getting harder and, you know, we say retention is the new cool all the time, but a lot of people have been starting to say back to me, it's not new and we need to find better ways and continue to build on this, you know, take good care of your people. And so, you know, going into the weekend, you know, it, it's always like Chef Dodge has said a few times, it's, you know, if people aren't with you when you're going into the fire, you're in, you're in trouble. And the fire starts probably around 5 p.m. tonight, Thursday evening, right? So, you know, I think just as much as we can influence the industry to just find ways to take better care of the people that are in it, inspire them, protect them. It can be, as the four of us know, a pretty awesome career if you can, you know, figure out how to navigate through it. So start the weekend off, right, I guess. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And it can be as simple as, you know, getting everybody together in a stand up first thing in the morning. And Chef, to your point, you know, this whole transparency and vulnerability thing, because they're looking for the humanity. They're looking for the emotional cues on how they're supposed to react to their environment. And to be able to stand up and say, you know, I thought I knew what the hell I was doing, but you know, I I, I don't. Like I think I have an idea, but I need but I actually need you. Like you have a seat at the table and, and I know that we're going to be going into this over the course of the weekend and we're going to be hanging on by our fingernails, but the dust is going to settle. And if we're not together, then, you know, it's going to be much harder on everybody. So I couldn't agree more transparency, vulnerability, having these com conversations. And again, to reference uh, a lot of the, the recent studies, especially during the great resignation, one of the top two reasons that people chose to leave their current position was communication or lack thereof. Like, treat me like a goddamn human being, man. I'm not just a pair of hands. I'm not a shift on a schedule. I have other things going on in my life, and I'm not sitting here trying to uh, encourage people to, you know, ex accept seasonable accommodations from their staff because it comes down to we're in service. Mm -hmm. But grounding that in a, in a respectful end, I say, you know, a sanctified way, because what we do really is, <laughs> really is a special thing. And there's not a lot of people that are called to this. So the people who are called, I think we owe it to them to, to be as humble and to be as transparent and vulnerable to them to know that, you know, as you progress in your career, you'll also see this. And so we've gotten some really great comments from folks. Darren chimed in, agreed. If you have a great culture, one of support, respect, and opportunity, you'll not struggle. Uh, Valentine said, I agree with Ryan on humility. Humility paves a way to learn about people around you, feel and experience. Shane's another great conversation. Thanks. So there is definitely, there's definitely an ear for this type of conversation. So I just wanted to say thank you. I know that we're over time, but I wasn't going to stop it because goddamn juicy. And I look forward, <laughs> we look forward to having you both back and just can't tell you how grateful, and I'll speak for Jim, how grateful we feel that you took the time out of your day to be with us and to share your experience and your wisdom. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and that feeling's mutual. Oh, thank you, bro. You guys are, are trying. The word that you're getting out here is. Yeah, it's. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Really welcome your comments, suggestions, and smart ass remarks. We're going to listen to them all and reply to them. So thank you very much, folks. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Turning the Table with me, 
Adam Lamb, and Jim Taylor. This episode was sponsored by Benchmark 60. We're on a mission to change the food and beverage industry by focusing on staff mental health and well-being, by forecasting and actively managing workload productivity. Over 200 restaurants and food and beverage operations have discovered for themselves how to increase staff retention and become a preferred employer in their market by using our proprietary system. If you'd like to have an operational culture that everybody wants to work for, then check out Benchmark 60 on the web at www.benchmark60.com. Thanks for taking the time to be with us and the courage to try new things for the restaurant profession's oldest problems. Turning the Table is a production of Realignment Media. Music.